I've played a video game. You know that by now because we're on to the third and final part of our definitive playthrough of The Legend of Zelda to celebrate the series' 35th anniversary. Last time we polished off levels 2 through 5, and today we're going from 6 to 9, and then punching Ganon in his ugly pig-shaped face. Before we head to level 6, we need to go and pick up an item for later on, since we're near a shop that sells it, so we're going to head into one of the scariest screens in the entire game. This is an area full of blue Lynels. As you might have gathered, blue anything is generally more powerful than the red version, so you can imagine how terrifying this screen is. Thankfully, we're well equipped and we're not going to make any stupid mistakes. We're here to open up this wall, which again is entirely optional, so don't go crying about how obscure it is. Now we could trek all the way back to where we got the blue ring and save 32 entire rupees on our bait. But we're here and we're flush with cash, so we might as well splurge while we've got the chance. Saves us a trip later on. Besides, this guy's shop was A, caved in by rocks, and B, crowded with a bunch of killer blue lionels, so he could probably do with the custom, to be honest. On the way to level 6, we'll stop off and pick up another optional extra, the power bracelet. In later games, this became a lot less optional, but it started life as a secret item that lets you move certain boulders in the overworld. These boulders reveal underground paths that link huge chunks of the map together so you can get around quicker. I will absolutely not be using them at all, because I already know where I'm going. But if you're doing a casual playthrough, I suggest picking it up. Right, level 6. Probably the first real test of your abilities, because we're getting to the point where all your extended health and the blue ring and the best sword in the game still might not save you. But that's okay. I suppose you might say the real Legend of Zelda starts here. Welcome to the first introduction of the Wizrobe, a ghostly enemy that's been a mainstay of the series ever since. What's great about this is this is another room that starts off dark, so the Wizrobe gets to fade in in a ghostly fashion. It's a really simple and effective use of established mechanics for a little visual punch. Orange ones are mostly fine. They teleport in, take a shot at you and teleport away again. You can only hit them when they're fully corporeal, but they also can't change direction, so they aim at wherever you're standing when they appear. But then, there's the blue ones. Blue whiz robes are corporeal most of the time, but when they're not, it's because they're phasing diagonally around the room, and if they happen to land on the same row as you, they'll shoot at you. They're fast, they hit hard, and they can really gang up into something deeply unpleasant. Level 6 also brings us the reuse of old bosses as mini-bosses, with the return of Gleok, which is nice. It's nice to see him still out and about, getting work. Same strategy, just tank his hits and stab him a lot. Level 6's title is a Dragon, and I feel like they're starting to phone it in a bit now. Personally, it reminds me more of E.T. from that Atari game, but never mind. Your item for the Dragon Labyrinth is the Magic Rod, which fires similar projectiles to a whiz robe, except it doesn't hit as hard as they do. And it's largely useless unless you've been hit by a bubble and you've got no arrows. Something to note in level 6 is you'll find this old man who tells you that there are secrets where fairies don't live. Keep that in mind, we'll come back to it in a bit. The boss for level 6 is Goma, who you might recognise famously as the first boss in Ocarina of Time, and a mainstay of Hyrule Warriors. Goma has one big eyeball in the middle of its body, although I used to think these were its eyes and this was some kind of mouth, because we couldn't see very clearly on CRT TVs and I was an idiot. Elsewhere in level 6, an old man will have told you if you didn't already know, which I do, to aim at the eyes of Goma. I've paused the video for quite a while because the boss fight goes like this. That was hard, wasn't it? But to be fair, the dungeon itself is quite challenging, so having an easy boss at the end only seems fair. Now remember the thing about fairies? In Zelda's overworld, a fairy will restore all of your hearts for free. They live in little fountains and they look like this. There's a few of them dotted around and they've stayed with the series on and off ever since. There's one place that's completely unique, which looks like it should have a fairy in, but doesn't. This is the entrance to level seven, and it's where fairies don't live. Are you paying attention? Let's say you're going along with experimentation and whatnot. You might try and burn the bushes, which won't do anything. You might kill the moblin who patrols here, which also won't do anything. You might try every item in your arsenal, because why wouldn't you? And when you do, if you're trying every item in your arsenal, you might blow the whistle. And when you do... Boom. Level 7. Is that a bit obscure? Maybe. But if you've been paying attention, then by now, you know how to solve puzzles in this game. You experiment, you try things, you see what works, and you keep trying stuff until you get somewhere. It's all been given to you, and you just need to pay attention. So level 7 is green. It's a bit of a throwback dungeon with a multitude of Gorias which you were killing in the first level, a Dig Dog and mini boss, and not really a lot else. Until you get here. Meet my spirit animal. This is a Goria that blocks the path with the text Grumble Grumble over his head. Is that him grumbling at you? No, it's his stomach. He's hungry. Remember when we bought that food back in that other shop? This is why we did that. Everything has a use. Eventually you'll try it all and you'll figure it out. 
That's Zelda in a nutshell. It's not confusing, it's just expecting you to pay attention and experiment. Level 7 is known as the Demon, and yeah, I guess so. It looks vaguely head-shaped, so I guess it might be a demon. And because it's head-shaped, you know what it has? An eyeball. And what do we already know about eyeballs in maps that seem like empty rooms? They're not empty rooms, we were paying attention. And down this staircase you'll find the red candle, which is like the blue candle, except red. Personally, I'd have thought a blue flame is slightly more exotic, rare and interesting than a standard red one, but okay. The red candle lets you use the torch as many times as you like on a single screen, which means if you wanted to, you could now rampage through the entire overworld forest, trying to set fire to every tree you come across. If you did, you'd uncover a lot of the secret rupees and hidden moblins that we've already got, because the game likes to let you experiment and it gives you the tools to do so. Remember how I said level 7 was a throwback dungeon? Well, that continues all the way to the boss, who is... Aquamentus, again. He's about as hard as he was first time round, except now you've got a ridiculous sword and take half as much damage, so you can just walk up and stab him in the face. Right, one more Triforce piece and then it's off to meet Ganon. Time for level 8. Level 8's location is hidden. It's hidden in a very secretive and cleverly hidden place. It's on this screen and I bet you can't spot it. Oh, that was a bit obvious, wasn't it? Yes, level 8 is under a bush. A bush that's placed so out of place that if you think that's too confusing and designed to get you to buy a strategy guide, I have to wonder whether you dress yourself in the morning. Level 8 is also a rather menacing grey colour, which matches our snazzy outfit and all feels a bit serious really. Right from the start we've got Manhandler, who was previously a dungeon boss, as a mini boss now, so just drop a bomb and get on with your life. First job is to get one of the dungeon's two items, which is in this room with a litany of horrible things in it. Down the stairs and we're picking up... a Bible? Bit of a fun fact for you, the main religion of Japan is Buddhism, so the Japanese have a tendency to use Christian mythology in the same way as we might use the ancient Greeks or the Norse, which I think is pretty cool. It's a good use of iconography. You can see the same thing on Link's shield, where there's a pretty obvious cross. Random fact about the shield, due to the fact that memory usage was at a premium, Link's sprite going to the left is just his sprite going to the right but flipped. What this means is that the hand he's holding his shield in changes depending on the direction you're going. I can't remember where I heard this and it might be one of those dumb internet rumours like Mew being under a truck or Marilyn Manson having his ribs removed, but supposedly the explanation is that Link always walks with his shield facing towards Death Mountain, so that he's always protecting himself from Ganon. Yeah, now that I've said that out loud it's clearly not true, but it is a nice thought. Anyway, the Bible, or magic book, or whatever you want to call it, powers up our magic wand to create a blast of fire when it impacts with something. It's still largely useless, and I never use it at all, but it's a nice thing to have. Right, back to the dungeon. Oh look, another manhandler. Please observe the uselessness of the magic rod. Bomb. Speaking of bomb, you are now in a closed room with no other exits. If you explore every room in the dungeon that you currently have access to, you're always in a closed room with no other exits. We must have to bomb our way out. We know this because we've been paying attention. Moving on to more rooms full of blue dark nuts, which are just the best, and into the boss's lair, since we're here anyway. It's another Gleok. This one has way too many heads, and because I've fought through 50 billion blue dark nuts, I have to use my potion. Oh no, how awful. Casual player, 0 out of 10 for skill. Anyway, all powered up, take down the stupid dragon and move on with our lives. But we're not done, so go back into level 8 because there's something we need to collect that'll make the final level that much easier. It's not the map, but since we've killed yet another manhandler you get to see that level 8 is the lion. Bit of a stretch, but alright. I'll also let them off because the name of this dungeon isn't really related to what it looks like, but to the item we've come back for. Kill another goma, this one with slightly more to it than a single arrow to the face, and head down this passage to retrieve our prize, the lion key. This is basically a skeleton key that replaces all other keys that you will ever pick up ever, and makes it so that you can just walk straight through a locked door without having to think about your rapidly dwindling key count. Convenient. Now we need to get up to the top of the map towards Death Mountain. You might be asking why I don't use the power bracelet to open up one of those underground tunnels and pick the closest one to the north. That's because I've got the whistle. You know that thing that you thought was just for puzzle solving and killing a dig dogger? It actually does serve a purpose. If you blow it on the overworld, it will send you to the entrance of a dungeon you've already beaten. There's a counter in the background that counts up from 1 and resets when it hits the number of dungeons you've cleared so far. And the number of times you blow it will determine which dungeon you go to. So what we're going to do is walk to the entrance of level 6, and from there, make our way to an area known as Spectacle Rock. Looks a bit suspicious this, doesn't it? Better get the bombs out. This is it. Level 9, the final dungeon. Ganon awaits. You can tell it's the final dungeon because it's the only one with its own specific music, which sounds ominous and full of doom. If we didn't have all 8 pieces of the Triforce, there'd be an old man here telling us we can't go any further, but because we do, he's not. Now like I said, level 9 is the last level in the game, 
As a result, it's the largest and most complicated dungeon of the lot. There are three key destinations that we have here, and I find it best to do them in order, so that even if you die, you've always got a goal for the next run. This is the point where you really should be drawing your own map, like I did when I was very, very young, before the invention of the text message. You'll be taking passages to get to other passages, and I think there's something like seven interconnected underground paths in level nine, so it's easy to get lost. Again, it's the last level. It's supposed to be hard. Don't complain. Something you'll come across a lot is this thing, Patra. Patra has little minions that circle around it in a smooth, pleasing, and occasionally almost weirdly three-dimensional way. Kill them all, then go for the blue one in the middle. Level 9's title is simply Death Mountain. And as you can see, the map is pleasingly arranged like a skull. Wholesome. You can also see how absolutely massive it is, which is why our staggered approach to exploration is so important. The first thing we're after is in a hidden room, in one of the few places where the map says there isn't a thing, which in Zelda terminology means there probably is. The red ring turns you red, and you now take half the damage that you did with the blue ring on before, which means you take a quarter of the damage overall that you would if you had no rings at all. It's not required to beat level 9, but it'll help. Now we need to go and fetch something else. Something that would later become iconic, even if it got changed around a little bit. An old man has told us before that secret power is said to be in the arrow. Now this applies to the pole's voice, which as we stated before, had to have their weakness changed because the NES doesn't let you yell at it as a game mechanic. But it also applies to Ganon, and the arrow that we need is deeper inside level 9. Make your way through room after room after room of painful, annoying blue whiz robes, and you'll finally reach a secret passageway heading downwards to our prize, the Silver Arrow. Silver presumably because of the old mythology that silver was effective against demons and Ganon is the Demon King. This would later get replaced by the light arrows that we've had in almost every game since, and serve as the big pig's one true weakness before the invention of the Master Sword. Right, we're as tooled up as we're ever going to be. About that time, eh chaps? Righto. Ganon is another trek away, down more passageways and through more mini-bosses, and it is a real slog to get there. That's not a criticism either, because it should be. This is the final boss of a huge, sprawling open-world adventure, at a time when open-world adventures didn't exist. It should feel like a dramatic ordeal, and level 9 is perfect for that. It's hard, and it tests pretty much every piece of knowledge that you've acquired over the course of your journey, so I hope you were paying attention. One more Patra mini-boss with, like I said, weirdly 3D effects going on, and we're ready. Walk into the darkness, raise the Triforce above your head, and get ready. Ganon is invisible. That's a thing he can do, apparently. He'll fly around shooting fireballs at you, and all you can do is scramble at nothing, hoping to make contact with him. Thankfully, he's a huge, massive, whacking great fat pig, and a reasonably easy target. Give him a few whacks, and eventually he'll turn from his fetching aquamarine colour to a bright red. That's your cue to shoot a single silver arrow right at his belt buckle. And in a flash of light, Ganon turns to dust and the Triforce of Power is ours. And I guess so is Princess Zelda, once you've put out some fire with your sword, which is apparently a thing you can do. And now finally, my biggest criticism of The Legend of Zelda. This ending is severely unsatisfactory. I get that we're on the NES, I get there wasn't much we could do, but oh my god is this not suitably rewarding considering everything we've just been through. This ends the story, they said. I bet you it doesn't. So in summary, that is The Legend of Zelda, a revolutionary title that isn't anywhere near as confusing as people might have you believe. Just a little bit of its time. Sure, there are things that could be improved, and I don't know if you've noticed, but they went on and improved those things pretty substantially over the years. The important takeaway from all this is that you should always pay attention. Zelda is an epic quest, a journey and an adventure that will require your dexterity, but possibly even more than that, your intuition, experimentation, and intelligence. And if you don't believe me, if you think I've made all of that up just to justify some nonsense old school game design, then let me ask you a question. What were you collecting? It wasn't the Triforce of Power, because Ganon had that. It wasn't the Triforce of Courage, because that didn't exist yet. It was, in fact, the Triforce of Wisdom. Think about it, and pay attention. If you've liked this video, and the fact that you've made it this far leads me to believe you probably have, then you should leave a like and subscribe if you'd like to see more videos about game design. I'm off now to celebrate Zelda's 35th anniversary, and silently panic that someone might ask me to do one of these for Zelda 2, which is not a prospect I'm looking forward to. Thank you for watching. Happy birthday, Zelda. And I'll see you the next time I'm thinking, hey, let's talk game design.